Hi there guys, and welcome to the next episode of Game Design Live on the Ascent. I'm so excited to show off this game. Um, Lothric, I'm also excited to try this game out. I have been playing a little bit of it, just to prepare some notes in advance. Um, we're just going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to start a new game, we're going to go from scratch. Um, as always, um, if anyone has any in, in things, or like areas of design they're interested in finding out more about, then please do shout out in the chat. I'm happy to talk about them in more detail um, through the sort of lens of a designer. Um, for anyone that's not seen the channel before, this is Game Design Live, which is basically um, a design deconstruction of a game while it's being played. Um, and it's also more interactive, so it's all about kind of asking questions that you're interested in finding out more about. Uh, if you're interested uh, or enjoy the content, please do uh, follow and check out additional content in the future. Um, you can also check out my Twitter, which is Um where I get, like, basically I go into a bunch of gaming news and game-related articles in terms of design or psychology, so... Uh, yeah, it kind of keeps you well informed, uh, so be sure to follow if that kind of thing is your deal. Cool, so without further ado, we're just going to get started. Um, we're going to hit up new game. I'm going to go with a new profile, and we're just going to kick off right away. So for anyone um, that isn't all that familiar with The Ascent, it's a isometric shooter, sci-fi, cyberpunk. That's the first game uh, by the developers that they've made. You've probably seen a couple of bits and pieces in the news recently around uh, the fact the Game Pass edition is lacking some of the visual tech that the Steam edition uh, does both, so there's no ray tracing at the moment, uh, for example. Uh, but other than that, I have seen a couple of bugs along the way as well. Uh, I'm not going to lie, there have been a few bits and pieces that have been a bit difficult. I'm going to be quiet now because this is a cool opening. I'm not going to ruin it for you by me talking. Cheers off for Roger, that would be great, thank you. I will say in advance, the visuals of this game are just stunning from beginning to as far as I got. Like, this is just incredible. a really rich cyberpunk sci-fi world the developers in terms of world building have really touched on something special we're gonna get into the gameplay very soon though like this is the kind of world that you see in something like judge dread remember does anyone remember judge dread like the sylvester stallone level of judge dread i'm probably just showing my age with that reference um but it's that sort of on par level Okay, for the purposes of just getting straight into it, I'm going to go ahead with this character, because he looks fantastic. I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, I don't want to keep you guys waiting. Although we will look at the character creator real quick before we dive in. It's a part of the game, so... Character creators, you know, I tend not to see an awful lot of character creators in isometric top-down top -down games. Diablo 3, for example, is, it doesn't really feature there. I know that in Diablo 4 they are planning a character creator, and I think from a from a game design perspective, it helps an awful lot in creating a far closer bond with your character. Um, you've maybe played games like Dragon Age, for example, that really go very deep into character creation, um, where you can adjust things like, you know, the bridge of your nose and the distance between your eyes, and if you're into that kind of thing, then power to you. I personally just get lost in that kind of stuff I can't I get so confused <laughs> to the point I just never end up playing the game so I had to say the character creator for me at least was pretty strong it gives you you know a selection of different pigments faces face inks um, you end up being able to pick your styles as well so there's a couple of different primary colors you can pick from you can choose from a bunch of different tops which are interesting <laughs> um, a few different hairstyles and a weapon skin which starts off as default um, but other than that, that, that really is kind of it. Uh, but we're going to go with this guy because why the heck not, right? But yeah, in terms of the character creator, I think they did a pretty good job. It's it's not super deep, but it's not that kind of game at the same time. Be as, being an isometric game as well, I think it's important to note that there's a difference in terms of the genre. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point there from Jimmy Schubert as well, that, you know, you're going to end up covered in an awful lot of armor. 
Um, and plus, you know, the camera angle. With a third-person game, you've got the, the ability to look right around your character. You're much more close into the action, so you get to almost admire your character an awful lot more. Whereas in an isometric game, you're way more at distance, right? So seeing how far your eyes are apart, you know, or the thickness of your lips, that's probably a lot less important. So going all in on a character creator for an isometric game is maybe not the smartest of moves to make. But who knows? Maybe someone somewhere will do it and it's going to be amazing. Uh, anyway, we're going with this guy. Let's just get started and we can check out the, the action. Cool. So straight off the bat, we've got a couple of things to note. Uh, you've got there the uh, the player ring around the player. You don't tend to have every... There you go, you see. So if you end up behind a piece of environment, your character gets silhouetted, which is quite common in isometric games because obviously the camera angle is a fixed angle, so you want to make sure that players never lose sight of their avatar. So that tends to be the case with most isometric games. You've got, got like I say, the player ring. So the player ring basically just indicates... A, where your player is, it's a bit harder to sometimes keep track of your character at this kind of camera angle, and also shows exactly which way they're facing. We're going to talk about the minimap as well at some point. Um, I do have things I want to call out with the minimap. Um, some pros and some cons and some things in between. But I mean, I mean, also just to call out the world itself, like the definition, the granularity, the, the attention to detail is just staggering. Um, <laughs> and uh, obviously, what would uh, what would uh, a game be without a set of fatuis to onboard you? Um, so, for anyone who's not familiar with the term, fatuis stand for first time user experience. It's a term used in the industry, uh, and they're often related to the tutorial. So, first time uh, FT uh, UEs fatuis. Uh, as the for short, um, and it usually relates to either intro videos or intro images to teach the player how to play, which is not what every game does, right? Like other games like Mario, for example, never bought into that kind of thing. It wasn't even a convention at the time with the first Mario. They just teach you to play through play. Um, but a lot of games going for this kind of stuff, which is fine. Um, so yeah, um, cl hold close. So yeah, you can crouch, which is an interesting addition, I thought, for an isometric. It's not often that you see a crouching as a thing in an isometric game. So you can crouch, and that is going to matter later on with regard to the cover system, which we're going to come to soon. You will also notice what I'm going to call this out right now, um, right before we get to some really nice visuals. Um, this player ring does a couple of things. It, it does what we talked about earlier, but also, interestingly, you'll see that there's sort of a couple of chevrons um, uh, that sort of follow on from the arrow of the player ring. These aren't just for show. These are actually uh, counters to indicate how many times you can dodge. So, you know, I'm going to go back here for a second. If I just run, then dodge. Now there's one chevron. Dodge again. Dodge again. Okay, now there's no chevrons. There we go. Now there's no chevrons. Uh, now there's one. Now there's two. So it's quite a nice way of sort of, without relying on any kind of corner UI, telling the player, this is how many this is how many dodges you've got locked up. They're ready to go. This is just incredible. Like, dodging in any game is always a, a bit of an interesting one. Cool. So, yeah, there are some interesting things to note in terms of their UX when it comes to messaging and button holding. So it says here, hold to close. I press and hold B. Fine. Uh, but um, when it comes to things like this, so X to authorize, I press and hold X, thinking that's what's required. And it's just a single press. So there are some, there is kind of a bit of weirdness in terms of communication around whether it's a press and hold versus just a press. Um, just something to, to call out. The way that things pop out of... Uh, that pop out of um, anything, like crates and... Yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one, Lothric. Like, <laughs> I thought it was just me for a while. I got really confused about it. Um, the way that things pop out of uh, corpses and boxes is very Diablo. They sort of fly up into the air and spill, uh, which is super satisfying. Uh, cool. This is something else to, f uh, to call out. So they have a breadcrumb trail. So when you press up on the D-pad, they draw a very pretty, a very pretty sort of sci-fi line uh, to tell you where to go. Do that again, because it just looks so good. Um, in terms of boxes, so there's obviously, obviously there's tons of things you can smash in this game, boxes being one of them. Um, and to smash them, it's a bit of a weird one. All you have to do is just literally just walk right into them, which is... 
you know, convenient. It, that would be that would be handy. Um, but yeah, so take of that, make of that what you will. Cool. Yep. So acquire more map segments as you reach new zones. Uh, your IMP will automatically survey and download relevant maps. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's crack on. Cool. Let's talk to a character. <laughs> so they finally sent back up. Normally, I would skip through dialogue, um, which I may end up doing, but if there's anyone that wants me to just sit through the dialogue, then please shout out and let me know. Otherwise, I will just skip through it because I don't want you guys just sitting listening to a bunch of dialogue that you might be just waiting to see the action. Um, plus, that is just me as a player. I have to say, the storytelling, I, didn't, well, I wasn't immediately grabbed, um, which is quite a common thing that I've heard in a lot of reviews online, is the storytelling. The world itself is spectacular. The storytelling... Maybe falls a little bit short of the mark. Um, I think that's that's somewhere where, um, <laughs> somewhere um, something that Diablo gets so right is you know the the style of storytelling in Diablo, which I'm going to compare this game to a lot because you know it's an isometric, therefore it's going to be a common reference. Um, in Diablo, you know you've got that very basic kind of there's the big bad guy, you're the good guy, go off and save the world, which you get right. It's it's standard, but you get it, and it makes you feel good, and it makes you feel important. That isn't so much the case in The Ascent, which is maybe part of the problem, or at least for me personally, it might be that you absolutely love the storytelling, um, but that was just my experience with it. Um, simple is often better, I find. So yeah, as you'll see as well, there are, um, I should probably call this out, there are dialogue options when you're talking to NPCs, which is cool, and again, uh, Diablo does a similar thing. They don't do anything in terms of add anything, any extra anything to the game really apart from just telling you more about that character's backstory bit of a weird one that i did spot as well whenever you pick something to say to a character so let's say i want to ask him about ferals the selector seems to jump back up to the top which i'm assuming is just a bug but it is a little bit frustrating there's also no way of sort of highlighting when you've asked a particular one yet yeah, indigo plays has already beaten me to it and called it out quite rightly so there's no way of knowing which ones i've already mentioned which I find crazy frustrating because I'm a, I have an OCD about that kind of stuff, guys. I'm not gonna lie. Um, anyway, we've talked to this guy with the pink mohawk. We're gonna move on. Um, we're gonna go and get some gunfighting in because that's what everyone really wants to see. Let's be honest. Did I do something with this? I can't quite remember. Nope, nothing with that. There are times where things look highlighted, um, like in an, an isometric highlights tend to be quite a common thing where you know an object is highlighted in a thin band of color. Um, whether it's white or it's red, and these colors tend to indicate different things, like enemies or interactables. And I have found often that in this game it can be a little bit difficult to understand when something's highlighted versus when it's just the way it's designed. Um, let's go around here. I really hope I've gone the right way. I have absolutely not gone the right way, and I can't do anything with that. Okay, let's go this way. You'll notice as well um, <laughs> that the roll um, is quite considerable in terms of distance. Um, and you tend to find that with those kind of rolls in games, what happens is that players will consistently just roll through the environment because it's the optimal way to traverse, right? It's the quickest way to get through the game world. Therefore, I will roll whenever I can. Um, and if that's not a problem for you when you're developing a game, that's fine. But it does kind of break the, break the immersion a little bit because I don't know about you guys, but I tend not to roll through the living room. Only on the weekends, I suppose. Okay, so, a couple of things to call out with the shooting. So now we've finally got a gun. Yay! Um, so yeah, when it comes to shooting, there's a couple of things here. Um, you'll probably notice straight away. First of all, there's the laser. Um, the laser is the same for every single gun. It's just a single beam. I will say that when playing catch co-op, this laser was not great in the sense that they don't change the color of the laser for different players. So if you've got two, three, four players, you're all going to have the same red laser, which makes it very difficult to tell who's aiming at what, um, which is which is a bit of a, an interesting one. You'll also notice, I'm probably wondering what this sort of white thing is, like partway across my laser. Um, this thing is there their spread reticle, basically. So this is a way of indicating how much your bullets are spreading. So if I start firing and keep firing, you'll see that it gets wider and wider and wider. And that is indicating how much my bullets are spreading as I'm firing. So the faster I fire, like in most uh, shooters, the bullets start spreading even more. Um, which is cool. 
Like it's not something I would have thought of doing in an isometric. I think that's a really interesting idea. Spread in an isometric shooter. Um, but the reticle itself, I don't know what it is. There's something maybe visually jarring about it for me. Um, there's just something that <laughs> stands out as a bit visually strange. Um, but spread is cool for sure. Uh, as you'd expect, um, you've got your, U your UI in the bottom right corner, so you've got bullets there. There's no ammunition, so we talked about Returnal, this and Returnal last time in the last episode of uh, GDL, where Returnal doesn't make the player go looking for bullets. This game, the exact same way, doesn't make you go looking for ammunition either. You've got infinite ammunition, but you do have a clip size. And here come some enemies, so we're going to start shooting guys down. So a couple of things to call out there in terms of the enemies and when they're taking damage. You've got those health bar chunks. Uh, which Returnal also does, which we talked about last time. Uh, you've got, I think, a very slight kind of flash on the on the enemy, but that could just be the, the lighting, to be totally fair. Uh, enemies drop um, items on occasion. They drop these sort of healing vials. They also drop health packs on occasion, which again is, uh, is, a, is a sort of a way of healing a bit more health, um, but they're optional, so there's no... It's a bit of a strange distinction. I'm not entirely sure why you maybe not want to pick this up straight away. It could be a co-op consideration. So, you know, if you're playing together, you don't want to accidentally walk over the healing pack and take it from someone who actually needs it, as opposed to these guys, which you just pick up by walking over them. There's something else as well to call it with the, with the aiming of these bad guys. Yeah, they are bad guys. Okay. You'll notice as well, there's, a, there's another very slim bar uh, underneath their health bar. Um, it's not really filling up very much right now because I'm dealing too much damage. Uh, they also have a stagger mechanic. So the same as Returnal, uh, they, have a, they seem to have a stagger mechanic included as well. You'll notice as well that the enemies... So this, we're going to talk a little bit about the minimap, actually. So the minimap is an interesting one. In many ways, I like it. I think it does a, a number of things really well. It doesn't suffer from uh, the same problems that a lot of other mini ma mini maps and games have. It's tough to say, like, really fast in the row, minimap. Um, it doesn't suffer from the same problems that other minimaps have. Minimaps, for example, in Grand Theft Auto, where you end up sort of playing the entire game through the minimap. Because, you know, for example, in Grand Theft Auto, uh, it tells you, oh, we're going to talk about aim height right after this. In Grand Theft Auto, you know, you've got the GPS sort of leading you through the environment, so that's all you're looking at is the minimap. Whereas here, because it's it's more like a motion scanner than anything else, you're looking entirely at the game the entire time, which I think is a really strong decision. Uh, so we just saw there's something to do with, this is the sort of main mechanic of the Ascent when it comes to its shooting, uh, which is um, aiming high. So what happens is if you pull the left trigger, your character raises their gun, um, and all this, <laughs> all this does, I say all, it's, it's still pretty cool, all it does is literally just physically raise the height of your aiming. So beforehand we're aiming down here, we're going to hit the stairs, but if I raise the gun, now we're aiming over the stairs, um, and uh, you're now aiming at the enemy, so you know if I shoot here, it's actually a really nice bit of level design as well. The fact they've set this up to very clearly show you exactly what this does. Um, you know, so I hit the stairs, but if I raise the gun and fire, now I'm hitting them. Um, and you're probably wondering, you know, well, why? <laughs> like, why, why do that? Like, what benefit does that have? How does that impact gameplay? So far, uh, from what I've seen, it, it's for situations like this, where, you know, you want to maintain a certain position, but you want to be able to hit the, the enemy. The other thing that I've seen them do often with this mechanic is that it lends into their version of a cover system. So what tends to happen is you, know, you can press B to crouch behind something and then fire over the cover while I take damage. Uh, fire over the cover um, while crouching. Which is, for a cover system, is actually kind of nice. Like it's really free flowing. Um, there's no kind of locking onto surfaces or weirdness with stickiness. Um, I have to say I've not tended to use the cover system all that much, um, which is some uh, kind of a problem I've seen in other games like Outriders, for example. I don't know if anyone else has played Outriders. Um, Outriders is a big title that recently got released. I say recently, the last few months was released by EA, um, and it's it's sort of like Gears of War meets Diablo. If I had to give it a very rough and dirty uh, razor, 
Um, I totally agree, by the way, that it is kind of hard to tell that you're aiming high when you're... Sta yeah, I completely agree. I mean, all you're really getting is the the elevation of your character. The camera also does kind of like jut forward a little bit, which is a really nice bit of feedback to tell the player, hey, you're doing this thing right now. Um, the player circle also expands slightly, um, but I think it's I think it's a fair observation. But I think in terms of, you know, the things they've done to try and help communicate that, they've definitely gone to some effort to, to make sure it's not just the physical animation changing. Uh, because again, in terms of being, we talked about, you know, the the differences between isometric and third person. In isometric, it's much harder to see details like that, small details like that. Um, but yeah, the cover system, like I was saying, in Outriders tended not to get, they went into a really deep cover system, like Gears of War level cover system, where you could lock on to cover and snap against it and move around and switch between cover. And honestly, guys, like I'm going to say, like, <laughs> I barely used it. It's very much a game about just running into you know, crowds of foes and just smashing them up. Um, which is kind of the gameplay this also lends itself towards. So the fact that they've gone quite, they've developed mechanics that are very cover inducive um, is an interesting one. Like a lot of the time when you're designing a game, it really comes down to, you know, what is the player doing a lot of the time? Like you want to be looking at, you know, what is the core activity? What's fun? Um, and based on that, that's the that's the the areas you want to start making decisions in. Like, what makes this game special and interesting and enjoyable? Is it is it taking cover? Is it is it running into groups of enemies? Is it gunning loads of down? Um, is it kiting enemies? Whatever it is, um, and that's definitely a big part of I think designing a a solid experience rather than just sort of like you know slapping in mechanics and dynamics that uh, that seem cool on paper but actually aren't all that conducive to what players tend to do in reality. Like, it doesn't matter what mechanics you offer a player. If there's an optimal way to play the game and win, that's usually what players are going to do. <laughs> You'll see the little disc there at the top of the character, which is the reload marker as well, which is um, pretty straightforward. I've completely gone the wrong way. We're going to go back this way. But yeah, interestingly with the minimap then, like we were saying, um, it is kind of more of a motion detector um, to the point that it even shows up enemy positions. So we talked before about, you know, the fact that a lot of the time you tend to, you know, with minimaps, you can almost end up playing the game through the minimap, which Returnal also, I've mentioned Returnal a couple of times, um, and just to call out as well, we'll be doing the second episode in Returnal of the two-parter uh, this Wednesday. But in Returnal, it's the exact same problem where enemies show up in the minimap, and this is no exception, which means that as, as much as I do love it, I think it does some things really well, it is a bit of a shame that it shows enemy positions because you end up looking in the top right corner a lot of the time instead of just your eyes being fixed in the center of the screen where all this goodness is happening, right? All this visual goodness um, and action. Oh, wow, we ran right past this. I say we, I mean I. So yeah, another example of a press and hold that looks like it would just be a press, but actually it's a press and hold. Okay, that could mean really anything. This is Boone! We're waiting around in feces up here! And you send your reports about erratic energy fluctuations? You have one job! Get it done! I've uploaded the SI access override codes. Don't ping me again until it's done! This guy's name is Poon. I just want to make that clear. That is his actual name. Uh, so let's, let's crack on. Um, and follow the marker and see where we end up next. We are going to look at a few other bits and pieces as well. We're going to look at the uh, the UI, um, or sorry, the, the inventory UI rather, to be more specific, and how that kind of looks and works. Um, and maybe kind of like deconstruct why some of the things work the way they work. That's what we're looking for right there. We're also going to talk about the UI, uh, the minimap iconography, which does get a little bit confusing. In terms of design, enemies are pretty straightforward. I mean, they're they're pretty much what you would expect from an isometric action game. Um, not too big on things like attack telegraphing. Um, they're really just kind of you know fodder to be gunned down. 
which is what you want, right? Like you wanna, you just want that sort of like taking out hordes of enemies experience. A lot of the time you'll tend to find that players associate games with other games, whether you want them to or not. It's what's known as mental models. So when we experience something um, and it makes enough of an impression of us, usually if it's the first time we've experienced something of that nature, that forms what's called the mental model in our minds. Um, and then we, we tend to compare similar things to that mental model. Um, it's a way the brain sort of like creates shortcuts for understanding things. It makes it easier for the brain to make connections. So it's just a, a faster way of comprehending new stuff. Um, so this is why a lot of the time when games like this come along, it is compared to things like Diablo because it made the first mental model uh, in someone's mind. Know what real pain feels like. So this is also something cool that I'm going to call out. Um, it's a bit of an interesting one. So there are areas in the game where you'll see on the minimap these guys aren't red dots, they're orange dots. This basically means that the enemies aren't aggro to us straight away. Um, they are enemies, but they won't attack us on sight. Instead what they'll do is they'll attack when we get, we get close enough to them. So far, from all, from what I can tell, the only s sort of reasoning for this is to let you avoid fights if you, maybe you don't want to engage with them. Um, and also to create a sort of maybe a slightly more rich game world, um, because you're in a, you, it feels like you're in an area that you're not supposed to be in because, you know, they're not attacking you on sight, but they will if you get too close to whatever they're guarding. So yeah, and then you get the exclamation mark to indicate, okay, now we're pissed, and then they come straight at you and and you do the thing like take damage for example. Ow! <laughs> you will notice as well that I've probably gunned down more um, NPCs uh, than I have enemies. Uh, a lot of the time when you're in gunfights there will be like peoples of the crowd, like general civilians that get in the way. There's no repercussion for that, there's no punishment. Um, they're just kind of in the way, they get gunned down and that's sort of the end of the story. In case you were wondering. So yeah, this is also something else that's uh, worth worth mentioning. So when it comes to finding new equipment, you can tap X to pick up a weapons and armor to place it in your inventory, or you can press and hold X to immediately equip it, which um, is kind of, and I, again, I totally agree, by the way, um, I'm totally surprised there's not a melee button. There's no melee skills as far as I've seen so whatsoever. It kind of feels sometimes like you'd want one, even just a default one. There have been times where I feel like I just my, my thumb wants to hit that button that doesn't exist. Um, so yeah, we're going to look at this for a second because it's, it's an interesting one. So th there's a new weapon on the floor. Um, this is also going to open up a bit more about the weapon design and um, equipping weapons in the game. But you'll notice there's, there's something kind of pretty major missing when I'm going up to this weapon, which is just any kind of information whatsoever, <laughs> like about this weapon. Uh, there's no kind of pop-up or UI or anything to tell me what the qualities of this weapon are, what its range is, what its damage is. So allowing the player to pick up and equip something straight away is great. Like, one of the main principles of really great UX design to make is making things convenient for the player. It's convenient and understandable as possible. But if I don't know what qualities this gun has, I can't make an informed decision. So it almost feels like a wasted interaction. Like, it's great that it's there, but I'm never going to use it. Um, because I just, I don't know if this is better. So we're going to pick it up anyway, because we don't have two guns. So we know in this one instance that we just want to pick it up and equip it. But other than that, it becomes pretty redundant. Cool. So like in Halo, if you're a, a Halo fan, if anyone's a Halo fan, um, you can equip up to two weapons, which you can swap between during gunfights. Which is an interesting choice. Um, I am going to talk a bit more about it in terms of why I think they might have done it, um, but also some of the uh, the observations I've, I've made when uh, when playing it myself. Let me just get this objective done as well. We're gonna do the thing. Fantastic. So yeah, you can swap between different weapons, um, which is all very well and good. It definitely helps. I've definitely found that it helps me when it comes to you know being in the thick of a firefight, like being able to swap to a different weapon. But that, in my experience, is been pretty much all it amounts to is having more ammunition in backup. In games like Halo where you're allowed to swap between weapons, usually the reason for that is because you're trying to equip yourself with weaponry to solve different combat situations. Every weapon has its strengths and weaknesses and by equipping two different weapons you can swap between, you create um, a new range of possible solutions for different combat problems. Now, in order for that to work, your combat problems have to be varied. Like, you know, and that comes down to your enemy design, it comes down to your enemy AI. 
in the game like this, the combat problem tends to be the exact same, which is there's a lot of enemies and they all need to die and they're all running at me. So the ability to swap between weapons feels a little bit um, a little bit less helpful, um, other than like I say, having access to more bullets straight away. Uh, there is, I mean, obviously they've got explodey barrels, which are done well. They are super sad. Everything in this game just looks amazing. So I'm going to blow this guy up. I mean, how cool was that, right? Blowing things up in games. Always fun. So like I mentioned at the start of the stream, if anyone uh, is enjoying the content, um, please do make sure to follow my channel. Uh, you can also check out my Twitter, at Battalion, where I usually post a bunch of different gaming-related news and articles related to uh, game design and game psychology. Uh, I try to keep as informed as possible because it's my job, so if, uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing, it's worth checking out. In terms of the enemy variation, Jimmy Schuber, uh, it's it's by and large the same. Um, enemies tend to be pretty kind of fodder, mobbish, and by and large run at you. There's, there's not too much variety. There are on occasion special enemies um, that are a little bit more interesting, but they're almost more sort of mini bosses that don't show up all that often. Saying that, I have only got like sort of three hours or so into the game. It could be that further in there's, there's more kind of like elaborate things to be seen. But for the most part, it is very much the sort of Diablo level style of enemy design, which is just crowds of enemies to gun down. The other thing that I do miss sometimes in this game, um, Lothric mentioned uh, a really kind of like cool point about a melee button. There is no sprint. I know there's no sprint in Diablo, <laughs> but it does feel a lot of the time like I just really want to sprint. I don't want to roll everywhere. I just want to press a button and just, you know, leg it. Uh, from what I've seen so far, at least, there's no way to speed up your character either. Um, Diablo did actually address this in a really interesting way. Diablo allows it to... In Diablo, you're allowed to gain or earn speed boosts by destroying stuff. So, you know, urns, crates, whatever, in a big enough supply. So if you smash, like, sort of, like, five crates or ten crates at once, you get a speed buff that lasts X number of seconds. Um, which is a really nice way of gamifying speed buffs, uh, or gamifying speed ups. Uh, but in the Ascent, from what I've seen so far, there's no kind of hint of that yet, anyway. Go this way. I mean, you can probably feel it here, right? Like me just having to like traipse through the environment fairly slowly. I am rolling as often as I can to get you guys from uh, one place to the other. Oh, we should probably use this actually. There was something I meant to call it with the with the aiming as well, which I'm still going to. It's not here in single player, interestingly enough. Oh, okay, we're going to talk about tacticals in just a second. Let's get rid of this and I'll talk about it in just a second. Um, but yeah, in couch co-op, when you're playing together, um, when you're aiming at an enemy, they display a sort of like a disc beneath their feet. Um, and this is to help indicate which enemy you yourself are aiming at versus somebody else. Um, but again, it gets a little bit messy when you're playing with another player because, like I say, the laser beams are the exact same color. Um, so tacticals, tacticals are essentially your special ability, um, your ultra ability that you can use by dealing enough damage to enemies, um, which is pretty standard. Uh, you've probably seen this kind of mechanic before in games like Destiny, for example, where you, over enough time, you earn the ability to do something cool. Whoa! We're gonna blow them up. I said I was going to compare this game to Diablo a lot, and I stand by that. Something else I think Diablo does well, which I would have loved to see in the Ascent, is just general feedback when you do something cool. Um, like, for example, there where I blew up a bunch of enemies with this exploding barrel. Um, Diablo does, it makes a big deal about reinforcing 
um, cool moments like that where you know you get told multi kill and and that in itself does something in terms of a buff for the game. Um, it's nice to feel in a game like the game understands when you do something cool. It's a big part of game design is you know the game seeming to be aware of you as a player and how great you are, right? As a as a player, the, and when you do something fantastic, you get a pat on the back for that. Um, and that's not often the case in 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 the ascent. But the guns themselves feel, do feel great to fire. Um, that much I will say, like, they do feel really satisfying to fire. Um, the sound effects are really well done, which is no easy feat. I and mean, again, just to touch on the visuals, this is just, we are just about to get to a really incredible point in it that really showcases the visuals. When these guys want to show off, they go in hard. Um, which we're going to see very shortly. You'll notice that I'm barely using the other gun. So you have the tactical, um, when it's ready and active, it sort of flashes red. Um, and then you press, uh, I think it's Y, which we're going to try in a second to, to actually use it. I have found this tactical, it might just be this tactical in, in particular, is quite difficult to use. It's almost like throwing a grenade, um, but there's no way of sort of uh, adjusting the distance of the grenade. Um, this is worth calling out as well. So all weapons can be upgraded if you have the required components. Visit a gunsmith to upgrade any weapon currently owned to the next MK level. Each level increases the damage. Weapon upgrades are persistent across all duplicates of that particular one. Even if you sell all currently... I love to give you an example of what they mean here. This is such a like spec level way of writing a, a tutorial slide. Even if you sell all currently owned P1 protector, the game will remember your mark if you get a new one. So what that means is that... Um, in case that didn't come across very well. What that means is that right now we've got this guy equipped, right? I forget what this gun is called. Let's just call it, you know, submachine gun. There will be times... I love this, by the way. The fact that NPCs react to me firing a gun, that's a nice touch. Like, that really helps create, uh, create the sense of a living world, um, which ties in very well to the level of um, visual strength this game includes. But yeah, so let's say that, you know, we get the right materials needed to upgrade the submachine gun. That means the next time you come across a submachine gun, it will also be more powerful because you upgrade the weapon type specifically, um, which is an interesting way of doing it. It's it's not Diablo at all, but that's a good thing. Bam. Oh, we're going to follow this way. We're going to use the breadcrumb trail, guys. The very pretty red. I just like looking at it. I did tell you. I've never seen lighting in an isometric game like this before. And this is without ray tracing. You don't get... This is what we were saying earlier as well, Lothric. Like, you don't get penalties for shooting NPCs. There are no consequences whatsoever. Um, other than feeling bad about it, if you're that way inclined. <laughs> um, but if you're not affected by it, uh, then yeah, it's, there's no repercussion whatsoever. All right, so this is an example of one of those special enemies that we talked about. This pretty guy right here. Papa Feral. So this is where the enemy design gets a bit more interesting. Um, you'll also notice that they go in for um, 2D attack telegraphing. So attack telegraphing is exactly what it sounds like. It's a way for an enemy to communicate, I'm about to attack, I'm about to do something. And more specifically, when I do do the thing, it's going to affect these areas. And, you know, games of different types and genres communicate that information uh, to varying degrees. Um, and isometrics, you tend to find that the, the UI and UX design around attack telegraphing is more along these lines, because again, like we said, smaller details, you're further away from the action, so you're wanting to get that top-down level of information. If anyone's interested, Hades by Supergiant is very much worth looking at when it comes to very well done attack telegraphing. Alright, let's take this guy down. 
He's sort of like a... Yeah, he's exactly like a small Brumac. That's exactly what he's like. Oh, boy. What's nice is as well as they close off the environment so you don't suffer from what's called the door problem. This is something we talked about in the last episode of Returnal on GDL. Um, the door problem relates to um, a topic brought up by Liz England in an earlier article, where basically players will use doors as a way to optimize combat situations. So, you know, coming in through a door, getting some shots off, then hiding behind the door, waiting for a bit to recover their health and coming back in for more gunfire. However, there we saw that they sort of barricaded off the, the arena with an energy field. Um, so they don't have that kind of problem. You're very much in the action once you're in the action. Cool. So this is another part of the game in terms of its progression and its loot system, which are things called augmentations. So augmentations can be bought and found. They give you new abilities and work even better if they sync well with your skills and attributes. Install augmentations via the journal out in the field or by visiting the grafter. Doing it with the grafter's without the grafter's touch will deplete your energy. You can find new augmentations in the world from enemies or buy them from the grafter. They don't really mention what energy is, so it's a bit confusing when you see this for the first time. Energy is basically mana in this game. You'll see there's a blue bar in my uh, UI in the bottom right corner. There's a blue bar on the far right side. That is energy. So if I go ahead and just equip that, we're going to look at the UI for the first time in the inventory as well. So this is, there, and this is the inventory screen. Um, you've got a bunch of different tabs here. You've got character, loadout. I will say every single tab has its own Fatui slide, um, <laughs> which is a little bit, it's a little bit something. Um, so yeah, you've got loadout, you've got armor. We're going to close all these one by one. Uh, you've got uh, augmentations. You've got the map, which I'm going to talk about very soon. And then the, the enemy codex. I have to say the enemy codex is actually in pretty incredible in terms of its detail. Like, you know, they go right in in terms of offering, you know, fully rendered 3D models with decoration um, and a little description as well. So it's it's pretty comprehensive um, as far as codexes go. Their map um, is an interesting one. Uh, so if we hit this, have a look at the map real quick. So this is their game world map, which you can use to navigate. Um, it also points out chests um, or chests of a certain type. I'm not sure if these are loot chests or like things that regenerate when you play again or if these are one-off prizes. It's not very clear. Um, what's also not super clear, um, again, for anyone who's played Diablo, you'll be aware of this. When you bring up the map in Diablo, they have a fog of war. And the fog of war in, in Diablo is quite helpful in the sense that it tells you where you've been and where you've not been. Uh, looking at this map, I have no idea, apart from the treasure chests, of course, which I may have just missed because I didn't want to pick them up. Um, I have no idea where I've been and where I've not been. Uh, we talked about this in the last episode of Returnal, how they get around this problem. Uh, but here, it's it's quite difficult to get a sense of what I've not explored. I do guess, I guess that, you know, there's only the chests to go and get. So really, that's probably all I care about. Um, I don't need to know exactly where I've been and where I've not been. Because all I need to know is where the stuff is that I want to collect. Um, but even so, you know, for someone who is like me, who wants to go off and really explore and see the world and all the different corners of it, it it's still nice information, to, I think, to offer the player. Thank you. Cool. So when it comes to the inventory, there's a few different things. You can rotate your character. You've got some stats along the right-hand side. Uh, you've got the credits you've collected, which is the soft currency, components, skill points, all the good stuff. Uh, you've got your loadouts. Um, so this is basically your inventory for weaponry, um, your armor, uh, your AUG slots. We're going to equip it. Yep, we've got one equipped right now. Is there anything else that we can show off here? I haven't seen bounties yet. We might come to that in the next episode if we have time. Skills-wise, so let's have a look at skills because that's always fun. So in terms of skills, uh, you know, what do you spend your skill points on? Uh, there are eight different stats that you can spend your points on. I have heard that when you level these up enough, you eventually get sort of perks or extra abilities that are granted to you. But looking at it at this level, there's no way of knowing that on the surface, which is maybe a good thing, maybe a bad thing, depending on what kind of camp you belong to. So each of these things do something different. So, you know, this one, for example, determines the amount of tactical charge that you g are, is gained um, from the damage that you inflict. Um, there's aiming, which is to do with uh, 
to what extent your spread recovers when you're firing. Um, balance, which is to do with uh, your resistance to stun, knockbacks and staggers and stuff like that. So depending on what kind of player you are, you might go for a certain sort of uh, specific combination of, of stats. And like I said before, guys, if there's anything you'd like more information on, if you'd like me to talk about anything in more detail, do please let me know in the chat. I'm more than happy to delve into certain areas in more detail. If there's anything that you'd like, that you're interested in, whether it's combat, weapons, enemies, world design, UX, it can be anything. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep talking. Cool, so let's have a look at the, uh, the augmentation in action. So we said about energy before, it's like mana, so if I just back up, bam. And that's an augmentation in action. And I have to say that they get the feel of augmentations really right. Like, at least in terms of this one, it feels very good to use. I don't know if it's to do with the visuals. I don't know if it's the amount of damage they do. Um, it could be the fact that um, it's the sound effects, that, which again, like I said before, are really well done. They feel fantastic to use. So you've, you've seen something that happened there that um, is worth calling out. Every so often they will mess with the camera, which I think is a really interesting choice. Um, let's go back here for a second. You see the camera sort of pans back up into traditional isometric, but to show off their world, which like we mentioned a couple of times is really well done. They actually just go ahead and manipulate the camera and rotate it to show you what they want to show you. Like this, for example, is almost a piece of concept art in motion um, and absolutely incredible uh, it, just the world building alone of this game it's just it's just a fascinating place to be um, and the ways they bring this world to life whether it's their NPCs reacting to gunfire there are also environmental events that we're going to get to at some point where we're going to see um, the environment uh, re responding to the player's presence in very active ways I'd also like to say a shout out to the the folk that have um, followed me. I really appreciate it. This is a new channel, so um, it's hugely appreciated. Thanks very much, guys. Um, I hope you're enjoying the content. I think there's nothing over here, is there? There's nothing over here. Okay, let's crack on. So we're about to see, um, in case you're wondering, this game is very much divided up into sort of sectors of world. So in some ways, it's very similar to almost Legend of Zelda. Um, and also Diablo to an, to an extent. However, I would, I would argue that this game is a lot more uh, a lot more stitched together. You can go from one environment and just walk straight into the next um, in, a, in, a, in a line, basically, albeit not a straight one. So it feels like a very immersive world, almost like Dark Souls, for example, where you can start off at one corner and just find your way, you know, all the way through to the other side of the game world. Um, and that's kind of what these guys do as well. Uh, so we're about to go to um, the sort of hub, I guess you'd call it, of the Ascent. The ascent group went into immediate default after These are the their loading the screens. Roughly. So Once you tend to find in games that require heavy loading, things like Destiny or this, for example, they'll incorporate dynamic loading scenes into their game. Uh, so in the case of Destiny, it's that moment where your ship takes off and it's sort of flying through space. In this game, it's taking an elevator. This is just, this is their opening credit. We've barely touched the, scratched the surface of the game, but this really shows off their visual prowess. What a world, right? Like I said before, their lighting is second to none. And again, this is without ray tracing. They are currently looking into adding ray tracing into the Game Pass version of The Ascent. But even without ray tracing, it's still breathtaking. Okay, so here we are in the sort of hub area of the game. 
Um, you'll notice a bunch of dots on the radar. I'm not sure why they felt the need to add them. You'll also notice a couple of different uh, changes. So we're not holding our gun, for one, to tell us that we're no longer in shitty mode. Um, you'll also notice that the color of the radar, the minimap in the top right corner, has changed from red to green. So that's uh, a couple of things they do to indicate to the player, hey, you're no longer in an action zone, you're now in a, in a safe zone almost. This is where you really start to feel the need for a sprint. Don't mind me, guys. Just rolling through. I'll run, actually, so you guys can actually can properly absorb the world. I think there's a chest in here. There is something. There are little bits and pieces as well to make the world more interactive. So, for example, you find these things that you can turn off and on for no reason whatsoever, but, you know, it's just a little something to interact with the world around you. You'll also notice, this is kind of cool, that when you walk into an NPC, they don't just sort of, you know, stay there. You don't run through them. Yeah, exactly that, Lothric. Like, when you run into crowds, they actually respond to you physically, um, which, again, is sort of tapping into what the Ascent does really well, I think, is making you feel like you're really in a place, in a physical world. It's also worth calling out, obviously we're not seeing it here, but when they do these kind of cutscenes in co-op, they animate and place all players currently present in the game session. Um, Outriders did the same thing, but it's something I don't see all that often. Usually it's just the player one or the main player that gets animated and added to the scene. Um, but in the Ascent, they, they go that extra mile. So anyone involved in the game feels like they too are part of that game world. Alright, let's just push on with the main story. And I'll see if I can show you guys a few more bits and pieces. Use the pretty breadcrumb trail again. That is, a, in case anyone isn't aware, that's a term that's frequently used for this thing is a is a breadcrumb trail. I'm referring to kind of like you know the old fairy tale story of Hansel and Gretel leaving a breadcrumb trail to find their way. Um, that is what this is called as a as a mechanic as a as a breadcrumb trail. So it's a mechanic that allows the player to understand where they're supposed to go, and is a term frequently used in the industry. This is the feed. With your very own grateful Abbott. The Ascent Group went into immediate default after the corporate AI filed for So I'm gonna go ahead and summarize this for you rather than have you sit through tons of dialogue. So long story short, the Ascent is the company that you work for. The concept the, the sort of narrative is that this city is run by, you know, a few mega companies, one of them being the Ascent. Um, and a lot of people come to the city to find work and opportunities, and in order to make that journey, they sell themselves to these companies. They're basically indentured into these companies and it's almost a form of slave, uh, slavery. Um, we as the player belong to the Ascent um, and the story goes that the Ascent has apparently collapsed as a business um, and people are scared and worried and panicking a little bit about the whole situation and aren't sure what to do about it. So uh, this is one of the many bars in the in the hub and again, visual design is just top notch. Um, if anyone has played Cyberpunk, you do see some striking similarities. Um, there are some interesting similarities as well in terms of the jargon or terminology that's used between the two games. Things like ICE, for example, uh, when it comes to hacking technology. Look, when we need a company rally or inspirational cap mugs to hand out, I'll let you know, okay? This is Poon. In case you missed that, this is the guy. All I'm saying is that we should stick together in a time of crisis and that we're here to help in any way we can. And all I'm saying is that I don't see how you can help right now. The Ascent group is gone on the border. It absolutely comes with the territory as well. Like there's there's bound to be sort of similarities because it's cyberpunk is, you know, that sort of that, that genre, right? So it's tapping into that same pool of lore. Okay, so we're going to talk to this guy, and we're going to get a mission. He's going to say a bunch of stuff. 
Again, if you'd like to sit through this, then do please, do please tell me. Um, but there is quite a lot of dialogue, and uh, you know, you guys are obviously more than free to to check it out um, if and when you get a chance to play it. But if that's the kind of thing you're interested in seeing, then let me know. I'm more than happy just to let it run its course. Cool, so let's have a look at the iconography um, in, the, in the mini map now that we're looking at side missions. So there are a number of side missions in the game, especially when you get to this point, um, which are indicated by these icons in the game, these sort of yellow icons, which is appreciated, right? Like, it's good to know exactly where a side mission is. You don't need to look very hard. Um, also, they lock to the edge of the mini map, so even though I'm not within range of this side mission that's up here, um, it locks to the edge, so I know exactly what direction it's in if I'm interested in checking it out. So we're going to go ahead and accept this side mission from what looks like a gremlin, but without the trademark infringements. And once we've done that, um, we get access to a new mission. So if we want to change a mission, we can go to the, the map here, and there's two different... This is the way they've done it, is they divide up their missions into main missions and side missions. So right now, we have a main mission active, but no side missions active. So if we go into side missions, there's the one we just picked up, which is Bubble Trouble. So if I go ahead and pick Bubble Trouble, which I'm going to do now, it selects that mission as the active one. So you can only have one mission active at any one time, whether it's a main mission or side mission. What that does is it shows a green icon on the minimap and a yellow icon at the edge of my screen. Um, which I do find a little bit of confusing. Um, it makes it look like there's maybe two different missions that I'm going toward. For a while, this did this did really throw me. Um, I press if I press uh, the button for the breadcrumb trail, it shows that that is the mission that I'm going for. But yeah, the two different colors of iconography is a bit of an interesting one. We'll pick up this other mini this other side mission while we're at it. Almost called it a mini mission. It's kind of a mini mission. Cool. And now we have another mini mission. I'm just, I'm just going with mini mission now. That is forever what we're going to call them. Let's just make that clear. Cool. So let's crack on outside. I think that's where we're going to wrap it up, guys. We've got two minutes to go, um, but I think this is a good place to stop um, before we crack on with the side missions and we have a bit more of a look at, um, like I say, some of those environmental events. Uh, we're going to have a bit more of a look at the weapon design. This is a two-parter episode, so... Um, oh, sorry, this is a two-parter series, rather, for The Ascent, so this has been the first episode. We're going to look at The Ascent again next Monday. Uh, if anyone's interested, we're going to have the second episode on Returnal this Wednesday. Uh, after the Returnal, we're going to be looking at um, Death's Door on the Xbox. That's the next one I've got lined up for you um, in tandem with The Ascent. Uh, but of course, if you've got any preferences or games that you'd be interested in seeing more of, do please message me directly on Twitch or on Twitter, which again is at AHThePallion, which there's a bunch of gaming news on and gaming-related articles. If you enjoy the content, then do please give me a follow um, or give me some feedback if there's anything you liked or didn't like. I'm more than open to suggestions. Um, but yeah, I really hope you enjoyed the stream. Thank you very much for coming along and for the new follows. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next time on Game Design Live. Thank you very much for coming along. Cheers, everyone.